Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our information session. I want to thank all of you for being here despite your busy schedules and the juggling act that I'm sure you're all doing to get your children, uh, you know, fed and off to bed uh, in the near future. So we appreciate the time that you're taking to be with us tonight. Uh, I am joined by my colleagues, uh, Claudia DeLuca and Sophia Orfanos. And as Danielle mentioned, we are the coordinators of the Center of Excellence for the Physically, Intellectually and Multi-Challenged which is a provincial service that is funded by the Ministry of Education. We are a multidisciplinary team and we've been in the field of education for approximately 15 to 20 years. Next slide, please. As we represent the Ministry of Education, uh, we will not be able to address questions relating to specific schools, school boards, or pertaining to an individual student. We must keep in mind that each school board is responsible for determining how to allocate services for students with identified needs and therefore the service delivery and supports will vary between each school board and school, as does the makeup of professionals working within each school board. In addition, we will not be discussing any specific conditions or diagnoses as the focus of our presentation is really on ministerial programs and supports. However, some of the content in our presentation is geared towards accessing services or funding based on identified needs as required by either the provincial government or specific community organizations. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our presentation is divided into four sections, um, educational programs and supports, government resources and funding, community organizations, and the roles of professionals. We really developed this presentation to help parents as they enter, as you enter the school system with your children, to essentially prepare you with an overview of what to expect as your child goes through the elementary years. Uh, I've often spoken uh, to my two colleagues as a parent myself. I'm a mother of three children, and my middle child is 11 years old and has Down syndrome. And I can't tell you the number of conversations we've had where I've shared my own frustrations and experiences navigating the system, um, you know, being frustrated by wait lists and, um, you know, the lack of information sharing. So we really wanted to put something together with you that would empower you, that would kind of guide you to asking the right questions and um, so you can further advocate and support your children. Following this presentation, we will be available for general questions during our Q&A period. And you will also receive a copy of our digital brochure, which will contain links to all the programs and resources that we will be speaking about this evening. So to get us started, we'll have Claudia start by explaining the various educational settings, educational programs, and supports. Go ahead, Claudia. Thank you, Sarah. So for, for the first part of our webinar tonight, we thought we'd go over some of the more commonly known supports and services within the context of public education. Um, before we start, we want to say that, of course, organization of services vary from one school or school board to another, and it really depends on the number of students that are identified as having handicaps, social mal maladjustments, or learning difficulties as well as the available resources in that region. So, so whatever we talk about today is really in general terms, and please understand that it can vary from school to school or school board to school board. All right, so to start, let's look at some educational settings. Um, the three most common types of settings are an inclusive setting, and this is where students attend a regular class with same age peers. Um, a self-contained classroom would be the next setting, and this is a classroom where the special education teacher is responsible for um, the instruction of all or most academic subjects. Um, the classroom is typically separated from the general education classrooms, but still within the same school. And the third um, setting would be a specialized school. So these are schools that are both in the private and public sector, um, and they serve uh, students with a wide variety of needs. Depending on the school's mission or mandate, they will have more specialized services geared toward the clientele they specialize in. Um, the list is long, so we won't go into to them tonight, but some examples of these, uh, some more common examples would be Makai Center School, um, which services students with significant motor or language impairments. Summit School is another example, which uh, services students with intellectual impairments um, or autism spectrum disorder. Um, Peter Hall as well, which services students with intellectual disabilities, autism, 
and as well uh, psychopathological disorders. When we look at educational programs, specifically at the elementary level, there really is only one option for most students. And I'll explain a little bit later why I say most. Um, so that, that education program that really serves most students in, at the elementary level is the Quebec education program. Um, it's more commonly referred to as the QEP. Um, most students in elementary and high school are following the QEP, um, unless a student is eligible to follow another program. This is the only program that a student must follow. The QEP is made up of a set of competencies and learning evaluation criteria for every cycle. And then the grades that are given in the report card reflect the student's learning performance in relation to the rest of the class, but within the context of these QEP competencies. So, for example, in mathematics, a competency could be to solve a situational problem. And the evaluation criteria would be to solve the problem correctly, to explain the solution and the procedures used to come to that answer. Um, so then to go back to what I had said earlier, if a student is not following the QEP um, at the elementary level, the only other education program that can be used is a CASP program, which stands for the competency-based approach to social participation. So a student would be eligible to follow this program if he, she had a diagnosis of a moderate to severe intellectual impairment. This program is, is centered around building competencies that would promote a more active participation in society. Um, within the context of this program, the student is not evaluated based on academic related knowledge, but skills that would be necessary in becoming a more active participa participant in social situations. So the competencies in this program are designed to encourage communication in social cool. situations, interacting harmoniously with others, um, learning to utilize information available in the environment, executing tasks methodically, as well as becoming aware of common dangers and learning how to act in a safe manner. So just to recap for the elementary level education, those are really the only two um, possible education programs. However, school teams will advise parents on which edu educational programs would best suit their needs of their child. So again, you know, whatever you know, uh, information you're gathering here today would really be for you to go back to your school teams um, to see what is their advice on the educational programs. Now let's look at um, some of the more common um, accommodations and supports available to students. So there is the individualized education plan. This is a plan that's created by the school uh, with collaboration from the student and the family to promote a more like solution based approach um, to enhance that student's learning strengths and considering factors that may impact um, his or her progress. Um, an IEP can be utilized for any student who requires it, regardless of which education program is used. Um, an IEP will include strategies and adaptations or possibly modifications that are needed for a student to meet his or her learning objectives. So let's look at what are adaptations. Adaptations help address inequalities or barriers that may prevent the student from equitable learning or evaluation. Um, these are strategies that are consistent or allowed by the ministry guidelines and need to respect the QEP requirements for evaluation of learning. So in general, students that use adaptations are really making their own choices and demonstrate their learning and understanding autonomously. Um, generally speaking, adaptations need to be included in an IEP, um, especially when adaptations are needed in the context of provincial exams. Um, in contrast to adaptations, there is modification. So modification is a term used to signify a change to the learning expectations and the evaluation criteria followed in the QEP. Uh, modifications usually follow when adaptations are not sufficient to help a student meet the learning objectives of the QEP. Um, generally speaking, these modifications are done on a case-by-case -case basis. And depending on the process outlined by the school or school board, there's typically information collected on that student's performance in order to judge when modifications um, to the expected learning objectives are needed and what essential knowledge is should be the focus in the IEP. Schools need to inform parents about the extent of these modifications and how they will impact on learning in future grades. Some other support measures that we want to discuss today, one of which is ministerial codes. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with these. 
Um, so you may or may not know that school boards need to declare the enrollments of the students in their schools. Generally speaking, that is why we always ask for students to be present on September 30th each year. Um, by doing so, um, different types of information uh, about the situation and characteristics of the students that are enrolled in those schools is submitted to the ministry. This information makes it possible to monitor the general profile of the students that attend the various schools or school centers. Um, for example, you know, is, is, you know, are, the, are students in a regular class setting or is there, are they in a specialized class setting? Do students have an individual education plan? Um, do they have a handicap? Depending on the information that's submitted to the ministry, the ministry will determine the allocations for funding granted to the school boards. And this ultimately impacts the hiring of teachers, professionals, um, behavior technicians and attendants that assist the students at, at the school. Since this information has a direct impact on funding, the ministry requires that school boards declare the students that have a diagnosis, which, follow, which fall under certain categories of needs. Um, these needs are also referred to as codes, and the ministry will carry out annual administrative checks of the declared codes in order to determine how much funding the school board should receive to hire personnel to assist the students at school. Therefore, students who have a known diagnosis um, that may impact their ability to carry out everyday school activities, whether it's physically or if it's significantly impacting their learning, um, they may meet criteria and qualify for a ministry code. Um, which in turn would allow for added support to the school. Not every diagnosis will qualify. So again, it would be the school or school board personnel who will be able to advise the parent or guardian. Finally, the last support measure that I will talk about is um, a measure called Measure 30810. Um, it's a special fund given to public schools by the Ministry of Education for the purchase of specialized equipment um, or technology required uh, by the school to help support students who are identified as having a special need. There are specific rules for eligibility for the equipment, um, as well as for how school boards can spend the money. Um, and I won't go into specifics because again, it may vary from one school board to another. However, I did wanna explain that whatever's purchased belongs to the school board and is loaned to a student for as long as he or she is attending a public school or for as long as he or she may need it for his learning. Um, the funds are limited and the amount of money that's allocated varies from school board to the school board. It's really determined by the ministry. So depending on you know, how many needs are at a school or, or how large a school board is, the, 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 money, the amount of money may vary. Um, when a student who has received the equipment for this measure leaves a public sector, the school board is expected to transfer that equipment to another student um, if that student leaves the public sector. So um, it, it really is, expect, we're expected to use that money to kind of move it from each student who is within the public sector who needs it. Um, and that money is also allocated to cover the cost to repair or replace equipment that was on loan and is no longer working. So if, as you can imagine, the money can quickly get used up and depending on the number of students who may require the equipment, sometimes or often enough, it's not enough to go around. So this concludes the section on educational services. Um, and now Sarah will speak to you about government resources and funding. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me, thank you, Claudia. So we can move on to the next slide whenever you're ready and I'll address just some uh, government resources and funding that you can apply for uh, if you meet the criteria. So if we could go to the next slide, we'll just look at um, a few areas that you can apply for, like I said. So I'll start with just general information. Uh, there are a lot of tax credits and tax breaks that are available for families uh, who have children with needs. So it's really important to consult uh, Retraite Quebec and the Canadian Revenue Agency to see if you do meet the criteria for any type of uh, additional tax breaks, you know, for the care of your child or respite services. Um, I'm not a financial planner, I'm not an expert in finances, always consult with a professional and an expert, but I'm just here to simply give you um, some resources that you can look into. That leads me into uh, our DSPs and our ESPs. Um, it's very important to talk about savings, um, you know, sooner than later for your children. Uh, both RDSP and RESP function in the same way as our retirement savings plan. 
So the first one that I'll speak about is the registered education savings plan. So that is something that families can start uh, putting money away for uh, post-secondary education. And it does include the handicapped child as well. So as a family, parents can start saving uh, towards your child's future, including a child with needs. Uh, there's many benefits. Uh, the government will, uh, you know, top up or match certain amounts of contributions. So it's something to look into. The same goes with the registered educate, uh, sorry, the registered disability savings plan. Uh, it again functions in the same way. It's money that you put aside for their future. And there's quite a few incentives again from the government uh, in terms of matching um, and, and topping up um, the, the amount of money that you are saving. So I just wanted to bring your attention to that. And while I'm on that topic, I just want to mention that um, it's really important to contact someone who specializes in investments, uh, your notary, your financial planner, someone at your local bank who can help guide you. Um, just to speak very generally, uh, money that is not registered in one of these plans, um, we have to be very careful as, as parents what we put in our children's names. Uh, I'm saying this because in the future, uh, for those of us who may have children who will be on social assistance, receiving benefits, there is an impact. There's in fact a limit in our savings accounts for these children um, that we cannot surpass. And it can have uh, you know, ramifications for what they're able to collect. So just inform yourself sooner than later so that you can plan and make sure that your children are receiving and entitled to you know, what you're putting away for them uh, in the future. Just very quickly, there's a wonderful website that is uh, recent this year. Uh, it's listed here. There's a direct link. Uh, it's the People with Disabilities website. And this one in conjunction with something by the OPHQ, um, they're very comprehensive websites that we just wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, they house so much information that's user friendly for families that relate to programs, allocations, supplements, uh, starting in daycare all the way through. Uh, talking about pensions, retirement, transportation, there's a whole gamut of topics there. So we just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll go over the supplements that um, you, you can, uh, you know, apply for if you meet the criteria. Uh, the first one is the supplement for handicapped children. So before you can apply for that, you do have to be receiving the family allowance. So if you qualify for the family allowance, please apply for the supplement for handicapped children. Um, again, we have the link in our digital brochure that you'll be receiving. It'll go directly to the application forms that you can download and complete uh, with the help of your healthcare provider and your treating uh, professional. And this supplement uh, is really to offset some of the costs that uh, are incurred uh, by families you know, for care or respite of your children. It's a $200 a month supplement that is not taxable and it's indexed every January. So um, I invite you to, to look into that one. And what's uh, quite exciting is more recently, there's been changes to the second supplement, which is the one for children requiring exceptional care. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in the past several years. Um, many files that were originally rejected or refused for the supplement have now been reopened, reviewed, and many, many parents and families are now receiving this, uh, this request. So basically, you apply once you've received your handicap uh, allowance, you apply for this one, and they're going to uh, channel you into basically a two tier of a program, one more for physical or cognitive limitations and one for complex care needs. Uh, it's quite a substantial amount of money. And again, if you've been rejected, um, you know, make sure your file is being reviewed, submit any recent evaluations you have, reports, um, and it should be reviewed and you should get a, a, a new answer, hopefully that you've been accepted. Um, but again, it's, it's been accessed by a lot of families in the recent years. So it's something to look into, but it really is for, for, for families who have children with severe and multiple uh, needs. What I'd also like to talk about um, on our next slide is community resources. Um, there's many community resources that exist um, the first being, we'll talk about the SEUS. So your SEUS is, you know, your local um, 
go to, I guess, to really access services and to ensure that you're uh, set up with your local readaptation center and that you're receiving support from either a social worker or an educator. Now we know there's long waiting lists, so um, that's just a reality of our system. Um, so I would suggest, you know, despite frustrations, continue to uh, try and access these services. The system does work when families are in need. Um, so basically you contact your, if you don't have a, a contact already, uh, go ahead and contact your sayers. They'll put you in touch with your readaptation center uh, and a social worker. Um, at the bare minimum, these individuals can at least sign forms for you to make sure that you're receiving what you're um, entitled to receive. We have to keep in mind that a lot of changes have occurred uh, in the system over the past several years. And so the service is a little bit different than it has been in the past. Um, in the past, families were assigned an educator and that educator would follow this, the family and the child throughout life span. Currently now, the educator is typically assigned for blocks of uh, intervention, and it depends on the need of the family. Files are temporarily closed between each uh, service block, but they can be reopened. Um, my advice would be to really communicate with your educator or social worker, whoever you, you have on your side and, and you know, be, be very transparent as to what your family's going through, where your needs are, because the system does work when families are in need. And the last thing you wanna do is, you know, get into a crisis situation where uh, you have to activate these uh, resources quickly. So have that open line of communication. And, you know, at this point, I wanna tell you some of the, um, some of the things that you might be eligible for the uh, the funding the you know with these changes uh, you know professionals have changed sometimes their dossiers are new to them so they might not be equipped with all of the information so I just want to give you a few things to uh, keep in the back of your mind that you can at least ask for because in my experience they they do change from worker to worker and even between the sayuses um, so as I've said uh, with all this reshuffling, um, you know, there's been a lot of changes and each service for some reason has different envelopes of money and these monies, uh, you need to ask about them. They're not often, you know, just handed to you, but um, some of the most important uh, monies that you might be able to access would be for respite. Um, so that depending on the CEOs is strictly for respite that comes twice a year. Uh, it's been augmented in the in the recent years, so that is a benefit. Uh, we have an increase in respite money. Some CUSs lump that together with um, a camp subsidy, and some don't. So you have to be very clear. Um, you you ask your local CUS, you know, can I receive respite money? What does your camp subsidy look like? Are you lumping that together in one one sum? And I've actually encountered because I've fluctuated between two uh, CUSs is one actually had a continual uh, amount of funding for camps each year within, within reason, there was a limit. And another CEUS um, just had a one-time offer of, of paying for a camp. So it really does depend. Uh, another important point to, to mention is elimination supplies or hygiene uh, care needs. So if your child requires uh, any type of pull-up, diaper, gloves, anything for that self-care, uh, this is paid for by the government and uh, it's delivered to your door four times a year. So it's something that you should inquire about and uh, hopefully receive if that's something you need. Something just to, admit, to mention as well, uh, for families that are really struggling with anything from, you know, getting ready for school routines, homework routines, um, after school, ask your social worker, you know, don't hide, don't be shy, really say, share your struggles. And uh, I know a friend of mine has recently been granted um, an extra envelope of money to help care with those types of transitions that are hard for her at home. So you really do have to be clear in your, um, in your struggles, uh, which are real so that they can be heard and supported. Um, as well, if, uh, if you do receive the support of an educator, um, the readaptation centers do have their own professionals. Again, it takes a request and, um, you know, based on their waitlist, 
Um, I'm not saying you're going to receive services from a professional, but the, the educator can make a request to, to have those services. Uh, educators are also there for home support, like I've mentioned, travel training, uh, support for camps. So many, many different um, roles that these educators can have. <laughs> So moving on to the next slide, um, there's also some wonderful community resources. And I mention these because, you know, our system isn't perfect um, and we all know of the wait lists and whatnot that exist. And some of these resources that are, are listed here, there's WIA, there's Trisomie uh, 21, there's Hopes and Dreams, there's Friendship Circle. They really, I guess, take, uh, you know, bridge that gap between what the system is not offering and what families need. So by that, it could be a listening ear, it could be advocacy, it could be support, it could be providing information sessions, uh, resource libraries, really building and fostering that community. Um, if that's something you're looking for, you know, they offer fundraisers, they'll, you know, they're, they're really, they're on your side. Um, I've contacted one personally uh, when I've had to file with human rights and they were by my side the entire uh, time. I see something in the chat. Yes, I'm from the West Island. So we have so many wonderful resources uh, in Point Claire, in Dorval. Um, we can speak to further in, the, um, in our question and answer period, but um, these community resources are, are so valuable. And even though some of these may be based in Montreal, for those of you who are you know, further out from the city, still contact some of these um, associations because they can refer you to provincial level supports as well, and, and even national. So I just wanted to highlight some of this uh, for you. And before I pass it on to my colleague, uh, there's also two really great publications that are out there that are free, that are accessible. Uh, one is Montreal Families. I'm sure most of you have heard of that. Uh, they have a wonderful section uh, for families with needs, uh, talking about different, um, different events, different classes, um, you know, science museums that are um, offering, um, you know, low stimulation kind of uh, activities. And uh, it's a really nice publication. And the other one is Inspirations. And Inspirations is a database that is very comprehensive. Uh, you can find it online and as well in paper uh, print. Uh, it comes home in school bags often. And uh, it really makes, um, you know, a nice read because it's full of information from experts, from families. Uh, again, it has, you know, tutoring centers, therapy centers, you name it. Um, it's a nice resource um, and creates a nice uh, community uh, for the special needs families in Montreal. And they collaborate with many outside partners. So that'll conclude my part and uh, we'll just move on to the next slide and I'll let Sophia take you through the roles and support that are offered by various professionals within the education system and externally. Right, Sophia. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we'll take a moment to talk about some of the specialists and professionals that you might encounter at different periods of your child's development. Um, so your family doctor or teacher might often be the first person that you talk to when you have concerns about your child's development, and they might then refer you to a specialist who can help identify ways um, to develop the specific skills in need of support. So most of the professionals that we are going to be discussing can work in different settings, um, such as schools, private practices, or hospitals. And we also want to acknowledge the fact that the wait lists and increased wait times are unfortunately a reality that we're faced with. Um, but to try to make things a little bit easier, we included direct links on how to contact some of these professionals in the digital brochure that you'll be receiving after the presentation. So, okay, we can get started. Um, we can move on to the next slide, please. So in addition to having a classroom teacher, your child might also receive support from a resource teacher. So a resource teacher will play a very important part in providing additional learning support by working in collaboration with the classroom teacher. So that could be through co-teaching, um, or what we call a pull-out model. So that would mean that they might work on a specific uh, skill set with your child outside of the classroom from time to time. Um, resource teachers also help ensure that provisions are made to cater to a student's individual learning profile, and they'll be actively involved in planning for IEPs or adaptations or perhaps modifications. 
Then we also have the Readaptation Centers and CIRS, um, which stands for the Integrated University Health and Social Service Centers. And they're really considered the, the hub or a reference point where families can access health and social uh, services in their territory. So they offer a vast range of support, such as specialized rehabilitation services, uh, community participation and integration services, and they'll help direct families towards the services uh, that are needed and that are provided within their territory. We also have uh, social workers who are also key players and can advocate for services um, in helping in areas such as family counseling uh, and support to parents, uh, as well as providing referrals to community and government agencies. So they work in close collaboration with many community programs um, and other services. Therefore, they can help find support uh, based on the individual needs of your child. So in the brochure that you'll be receiving, we included a link to finding a social worker in the private sector, but you might also be eligible to one in the public center. Um, and for that, you'd have to call your local CIUS. And um, in the brochure, we also included a link um, to all of the uh, contacts for the different territories. So moving along, well, most of us know uh, and are familiar with family doctors, and they're not only the ones who will monitor uh, your child's medical condition throughout the years, but they're most likely the ones who will also confirm a diagnosis, and they can help provide a referral to uh, an external service if needed. Um, and they're also um, very important in uh, helping out with the completion of forms to be uh, eligible to your allocations. Next slide, please. So you may be referred uh, to a physiotherapist um, and they can provide treatment in overcoming movement uh, and physical challenges, such as problems uh, with balance and, and coordination. Um, along the way, your child might also be referred to a psychologist. So they'll be able to conduct cognitive and academic assessments um, and then help the school team with program placement. Uh, they can also help in creating plans to best support a student's well-being in all life areas. So that's making sure that their needs are met not only academically, but also socially, behaviorally, and emotionally. You might also be uh, referred to an occupational therapist and they will help evaluate and develop uh, functional skills needed in everyday life by identifying and attempting to reduce the obstacles which impede um, an individual's performance um, and autonomy in the areas of uh, self-care, schoolwork, and leisure. So last but not least, uh, we also have speech and language pathologists. So they're specialists in language development, and their main goal is to help implement ways to support a child's ability to communicate in a more functional and meaningful way. So that could be through verbal messages, but it could also be through the use and introduction of gestures, um, use of visuals, or assistive technology devices. And they also work in adapting the child's environment, uh, whether it be at home or at school or both, to make sure that these children have access to whichever mode of language and communication they um, use uh, wherever they go. So that was a brief and, and general overview of some of the ways that these professionals uh, can provide their services. However, we also wanna mention that they all have a very wide scope of practice that cater to a variety of needs uh, that we might not have touched upon during our presentation. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the end of our presentation, and we hope you've gained some knowledge and information of the educational services, the government resources and funding, along with the community uh, resources uh, and professionals that are available to support you and your family. Uh, next slide, please, Claudia. So we realize that we've given you a lot of information tonight in a short amount of time, but as we mentioned, uh, you'll be able to refer back to all of this in the brochure that you will be receiving shortly. Um, and we would like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us tonight, and we will now be opening the floor to any questions that you might have about tonight's discussion.